Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we come with a grateful heart for this magnificent gift of Jesus, that you would send one such as your own son to suffer, bleed, and die for us, that we might have the opportunity of salvation through our faith in him. The time of prayer as we're having this morning when we can reach out to both our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and God our Father and our Holy Spirit and just have an opportunity to lay our hearts before you today. We ask you to look upon us with favor and forgive us of the shortcomings of our life and the sin that so easily besets us as we make this journey through this world. And help us, Lord, to realize that you are an anchor, an anchor in the heart of our faith that establishes us and keeps us strong and shields us from as much as you possibly can. And we just pray this morning, Lord, we'd have a greater resilience in our own hearts and minds to make good decisions that will uplift Christ our Lord. Bless in these moments as we've come together to worship you, to lift up your name in praise, to offer again our hearts before you in openness. Bless us now in these moments is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated till Doug makes you get up. <laughs> I just want to say one thing. These beautiful lighted gourds, if they ever come up missing, I'm the first suspect. <laughs> They're beautiful. Good morning. Good morning. I, I hope y'all have more energy than I do this morning. Yeah, you look like you're gas tank. I'm tired. He's tired. I'm tired. I had the distinct privilege yesterday morning of working out with 10th degree Grandmaster Phil Wildman from the Dallas area. He was one of the pioneers of karate in Texas from the mid 60s. Um, he was on the United States national team with Jeff Smith, Superfoot Wallace and Joe Lewis. Wow. He was the fourth member of the team. Uh, this 69 year old gentleman is a super great guy, Christian man, um, tough as the day is long. <laughs> and uh, we had a very intense workout yesterday, I'll put it that way, very intense. But uh, he is a, he is, represents a standard to strive for. And uh, I was quite privileged to work out with him yesterday. So that's one thing I'm thankful for this morning. Um, I would ask this morning, uh, I heard from my good friend in Arkansas, Bobby Teague, yesterday, president of the Karate for Christ Association of uh, Arkansas. Um, I would ask for prayers this morning. His mother is in the hospital, uh, not in good health. Um, I'm waiting on an update this morning. And uh, she is a, a great, great Christian woman. I've, I've met her and uh, she, uh, she represents the the way you should live a Christian life. She's a great, great woman. And he asked if our church would uh, remember his mother in prayers uh, as she goes through this difficult time in the hospital. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what's wrong with her. I didn't want to just come out and ask, uh, but I know that the need is there for our prayer. So uh, let's please remember uh, Bobby Teague's family and his mother specifically in our prayers this morning. Um, if you will look on the left-hand side of your bulletin this morning, um, our Lottie Moon Christmas offering goal, we're starting it a little bit early this year uh, because we have raised our goal this year to $1,000. Uh, normally we hover around the $500 range. This year we've decided to raise it to $1,000. For the Lottie Moon Foreign Christmas uh, mission offering this year. So uh, keep that in your thoughts and prayers. Here, I don't know, next week or in the next couple weeks, we'll have our, our tote board going over here and we'll have a running total of what we've got going on it. Uh, Joyce, do we have envelopes for that? Yes, we have some out this morning. Okay, we have envelopes out for that. Um, if you can't find one of those, just take a regular envelope, envelope, write Lottie Moon on it. We'll make sure it gets to where it needs to be. Um, let's see, what else have we got going on today? Tomorrow, the 19th, will be the uh, Norma Reed WMU meeting here in the Fellowship Hall. 
Oh, Lord, they're going to be stuffing Christmas candy sacks. Okay, this will be a uh, a true study in comedy, I'm sure. Um, as the women get together with uh, um, candy in front of them and uh, stuffing candy sacks, I'm sure there will be much laughter involved in this, much uh, hilarity. Um, I would like to be a fly on the wall to see uh, the goings on back here tomorrow. But uh, beyond the candy, I'm sure they're going to have uh, some food. And uh, let's, ladies, let's let's try to get more candy in the bags than <laughs> than we uh, get in we ourselves. As, okay. We were more automated than Mary of Pudding Hill <laughs> <laughs> since she's closed down. And they call me Doctor Love. Down. Okay. Um, yeah, um, and like I said, this this brings back memories of the great scene from I Love Lucy when Lucy and Ethel were in the candy factory trying to keep up with everything. So um, I know they're going to have a good time. It's going to be good fellowship. They're putting these candy sacks together. This is for the Grand Central Station, correct? Yes. For their Christmas party. For their Christmas party at the Grand Central Station. Um just thinking about it makes me laugh. I know, I know y'all are going to have fun. I know y'all are going to have more fun tomorrow than I'm going to have. So anyway, uh, come be a part of that. Um, it'll be a great time of fellowship, but it's for a really, really good cause. Grand Central Station and the Greenhouse, they do uh, untold good works around this town. You have no idea how much benefit they provide to the, the homeless and the less fortunate here in our town and in this county. Grayson County, um, to to think that there are at least 2,500 homeless people just in this county alone, that's hard to believe. As I, as I always say, I drive through White Wright, Texas twice a day on my way to and from work, and that's greater than the population of White Wright, Texas. So uh, we have a whole town, a whole city worth of homeless right here in our own county. So you can imagine what it's like statewide. You can imagine what it's like nationwide. And you can imagine what it's like worldwide. They say that 1.7 to 2 billion people on this planet out of a little over 7 billion people do not have a roof over their head at night. Given the vast wealth and technology in this world, there's no excuse for that. Nobody on this planet should ever have to go to bed hungry. Amen. Ever. Nobody should want for shelter ever. So we choose to participate in these two local ministries and we can see the results of our efforts with our own two eyes right here in our own community. And uh, we are, as winter is coming, I told you fall to get here. Okay, <laughs> winter's gonna get here too. Um, we're, you know, collecting clothes, toiletry items, blankets, hats, gloves, shoes, boots, uh, anything of that nature that can help out the less fortunate here in our own town. Let's pull together and let's, uh, let's show these people that there are people out there that do care. So many of these people go through their lives feeling that nobody cares for them. But uh, we do care and uh, we want to help. So please, let's, uh, let, let's keep these ongoing local ministries. Let, let's keep them. Let's keep our support behind them. Our treasurer's report for uh, November. Here again, Jim doing a fantastic job. We appreciate him stepping up and taking this over. Um, we have $40 toward our November insurance payment earmarked already. Uh, we have a, about $2,841 in the uh, roof building fund. Roof's holding its own still. It's hanging in there. It's hanging in there. Uh, the hand of God is hanging in there. Yeah. Uh, he will, uh, I firmly believe, take care of this uh, this roof situation until we get the available funds for it. Like I said, uh, he's going to make sure it happens in his good time. So uh, we need to uh, keep up our financial responsibilities for this uh, great insurance policy that we got that Dad was able to secure for us. Uh, that was a blessing that literally fell right out of heaven, wasn't it? Yes. So. Uh, we encourage you to participate in that. Um, as we get closer to the Christmas season, let's uh, let's keep our law enforcement again 
in our thoughts and prayers uh, the terrible, terrible wildfires in California, the deadliest wildfires they have ever seen in the history of California. Um, and it, it, it went from zero to full blown in the space of 48 hours. It's, and the devastation is just, it looks like a war zone over there. And so many of our uh, firefighters from around the country have volunteered their time to go out there and help fight it. My friend, uh, Jake Papa Giorgio, he's the fire marshal in Greenville, great man, ex uh, Navy uh, rescue diver. Uh, he's a great, great man. He, uh, they have actually had firefighters from as far away as Israel come over to help fight the California wildfires. In fact, he told me the other day, he said, I'm on a 24 hour notice if something bad happens in Israel, they have sent so many of their own firefighters to California that he's on call to go to Israel if the need arises. So they have a plane waiting at the L3 factory in uh, Greenville on standby on the end of the runway in case they need to send firefighters to Israel. So this is uh, the worldwide community coming together to help each other. Uh, Israel, one of our greatest allies, stepped up and said, we want to come help our American friends in their time of need. Um, the world treats Israel horribly. We are one of the few countries on this planet that treats Israel as an equal and as a brother and they have decided to respond in kind to us in our time of need. So let's, uh, let's keep our firefighters, our EMTs, in our thoughts and prayers, our law enforcement, and uh, our great allies around the world that stand with the United States. So many countries stand against us. The few that stand with us, we need to fully appreciate them and keep them in our thoughts and prayers. Let's all take a hymnal now, stand together, and turn to number 485. <laughs> stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldier of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For through the mighty conflict in this his glory. Day. He who were to now serve him against a numbered foe. Let me defy the danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next foe. Song to him that overcome, the crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I just came to one realization while singing that song right then. I'm blind. Uh, <laughs> Let's all turn over now to number 469. A little blurry, huh? Uh, more than a little. <laughs> <laughs>
spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Him, let's all stand together and turn to number 330. 30. 30. Amazing grace. Please, in the spirit of prayer. Brother Jim, would you lead us as we pray? Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We just thank you for all the many blessings that you provide for us each day. I just ask now that you would look after each and every one of us, and guide us, and help us as we take up this donation. Let these funds be used to glorify your name and to help the, in this church and the communities. We ask now that you would bless this offering. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. see every one of y'all here today. I've always known and found out through life that it's the dark times that makes us appreciate the light times. And without them, we wouldn't know which was which. You know, without pain, that old thing, no pain, no gain. Without pain, you really have no gain. So I thank God this morning for pain because I know when it comes around, he will too. <laughs> he never lets us go through it by ourselves. the 
Just before the message this morning, let's all stand together. Number 244 this morning, let's have silent prayer for relief from the devastating wildfire.
this morning we're excited to see each of you come and brave the cold wind it's kind of cutting through us this morning and and come to be here in the house of the lord Amen. a place where we can find solace in time of need and as dean is saying a moment ago we can come to realize that we're in the very hand of god this morning Amen. that's where he keeps us and uh, gives us opportunities to uh, have great joy in him i want to invite you to the book of hebrews uh, the uh, eighth ninth chapter hebrews chapter nine and we're going to go down to verse 14. how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal holy spirit offer himself without spot to god to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living god you know this morning we could not be serving god this morning without a relationship with jesus christ we would not be accepted into the family of God without having trusted His Son as our personal Lord and Savior. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but by me. And so what we want to be doing then is to let our consciences be purged from our dead works to begin to serve this living God. Verse 15, for this cause He is the mediator of the New Testament by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament. You know, when Adam and Eve in the garden violated the laws of God and partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and God had to drive them out, that debt has been passed upon every generation. The day I was born, the day you were born, we were born with a sin debt. And our souls were blackened before God because of our lack of attention to the message of God. And down through life we become accountable and then we make our decision either for or against the Lord Jesus Christ. But in this 15th verse he says, that we were under the first testament that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. You know, the Spirit of God speaks to our hearts when we're lost and woos us to Christ according to Scripture. That's His job is to draw us to Jesus to make that decision about Christ. Verse 16, where the testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. See, if Christ had come and not died, we wouldn't have anything this morning. If he just come and walked among us and taught his teachings and his word and then one day just decided to go, we wouldn't have anything. But because he died, his testimony is valid today. One of the great joys is knowing of resurrection morning when God will call forth those of us who are sleeping Jesus to the great reunion with him. Amen. Verse 17, for of a, a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator lives. No one's paid the price is the reason for that. And so this morning, we have two choices in a world in which we live today. We can pay for our own sins before Almighty God and be sentenced to a devil's hell for eternity, or we can humble ourselves and trust Jesus as our Savior and let His death cover our sins with His own blood shed blood and live eternity with the Lord Jesus. Now, notice in verse 18, Whereupon ne neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. What did God do in that first testament? He reached down and slew an innocent animal in the garden. An innocent animal. Adam had nothing to do with their sin. Nothing to do with their breaking the law of God. Nothing to do with their estranging themselves from the Lord. Okay? And so what does he do? Innocent blood was shed. What about Jesus? He had no sin, the Bible says, but became sin for us. And so he is like that first sacrifice. His blood is innocent of anything within himself. Amen. But as that young animal that was slain, that was innocent and imparted unto them, pointing forward to the cross of Christ when he would suffer, bleed, and die. Now in verse 19 it says, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wood and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Here's what he said, Moses said, this is the book of the, uh, this is the blood of the, of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. That means God has given you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood all the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. Amen. A life has to be given. It cost Christ his life. Suffering on a cross, being spit upon, the beard plucked from his cheek, back ripped open with, with a cat of nine tails into ribbons. Hug on an old rough cross to have to force himself up as best he could against that grain with that raw back to get those little gasps of air. And yet he did that because he loves you. Amen. Now think about that. Amen. 
God loves you. And how much does he love you? Enough to send Jesus to die for you. How much does he want you to be part of his spiritual family? Enough to send Christ to walk among us, to do the many things that Jesus did. And you know, when we talk about the, the miracles of Jesus, think about this. The greatest miracle of Christ is that he would die for you and rise again. Amen. That's the greatest miracle. It's not like just giving eyesight to the blind or, or hearing to the deaf or, or strength to the weak or, or, or healing those people. It was about him dying himself and then rising in victory so we could get excited about resurrection morning. You know, we have to think about in a few months from now, we'll be having Easter services. And Easter services is not about egg colored eggs and baskets of green grass. It's not about that at all. That's what Satan has brought into our experience today to take our focus away from Christ about the great moment of resurrection. You know, when they came, the women to anoint the body of Jesus, the angels appeared to them when they found the stone rolled away and they looked in and they said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, he is risen. Every once in a while we'll see where someone's getting up an expedition to go look for the bones of Jesus. What a waste of money, you know? Think about that. Why look for that which is not here? The Word of God tells us He's not here. His Holy Word says He is risen and now is sitting at the right hand of the Father and He's not just sitting there on vacation, folks. He's sitting there making intercession for us. Amen. When we pray in the name of Jesus, Jesus takes care of that because that's what he wants to do. That's what his job is. That's what his great love is, is to do for us all the many things that we never think about ourselves anyway. Now, he tells us here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse four, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats would take away sin. That's a temporary payment. It's a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus that will take away our sins. So all through Old Testament, from the time they came forth from the garden after God had sacrificed that first innocent animal until the time of the birth of Christ and the life of Christ and the teachings of Christ and the death of Christ and then the resurrection, that validated all of their faith of the Old Testament. Amen. Just like today, we look back to the time of the cross and our faith when we call upon Jesus for salvation is validated at the cross. You see? Man told me one time, says, well, I think you could be saved more than once. I said, you can't be. Let me tell you why. You couldn't be saved twice because you'd have to have another death of Jesus. Amen. Well, I never thought about that. I said, there's a difference between a person saying, well, I'm a Christian, but I haven't served God as I should. I want to rededicate my life. That's not being saved again because you can only be saved once. You can only be lost once. And so we discover how important that is for us. Now, I want you to take your Bible for just a moment, if you would, please, and go to the book of Matthew. Uh, here in the book of Matthew chapter 10, we're going to pick up at verse 26. And this is a great passage. Matthew 10 and 26. <clears throat> Fear not them, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, nor hidden that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak you in the light that you may hear in the ear and preach upon the housetops. Now, we could stop right there, and that's a great part of the message, but look if we go further then to verse 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Amen. If someone came in here this morning and shot every one of us, and those of us who are born-again Christians, it wouldn't be a bad day for us. Right. My friend used to say, we get to work early, Amen. you know? <laughs> I think about getting off work early some days, you know? <laughs> But he says, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both your body and your soul in hell. That's when we don't know Christ. When the forces of Satan are leading us and guiding us and shaping us and molding us and driving us forward in the things of sin. And the Bible says it's so important for us to be aware of who, where the power lies. The marvelous book of Luke in the fifth chapter God talks to us about the fact that we need to focus and realize and understand the movement of Christ. Let's begin, if we could, in, uh, let's see here, verse 10, Luke 5, 10. So also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon, 
And Jesus said to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. They've been out there working all night long trying to catch some fish. And finally Jesus came and said, Put your nets down on the other side. And they said, well, No, 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 no. We fished on this side and that side, the front and the back, and we've been all over the lake. We haven't caught nothing. He said, Just let it down. Just in simple, childlike faith, let your net down. And it caught so many. Had it not been for God strengthening the nets, they couldn't have got them all in. And once he had shown them what, he, what could happen through the Word of God and the listening power to do what God asked you to do, then he said, Fear not, Simon, for henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ship to the land, they forsook all of it. They left the catch of fish. They left the boat. They left all of this and followed him. What a moment of great clarity. God's Word works. If you don't learn anything else in the message this morning, remember that when you leave today. God's Word works. We don't have to worry about it working this time and not this time or starting this. It always works, you know? Now, we have an occasion when Jesus, beginning in verse 27 of, of Luke chapter 5, after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said to him, Follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. This was the guy's job. He was a tax collector. But what happened? It said he left everything. He left his roles. He left his little booth. He left, and, every, and just followed Jesus. Okay? And he left all and rose up and followed him. And Levi made a great feast in his own house. And there was great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But the scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples saying, Why do you eat with drink with publicans and sinners? You know what that would be like? That would be like saying to a doctor, Why would you open up your office today? Why don't you go to the hospital to visit the sick? That's what they do. That's what the doctor does. This is what disciples do. Amen. We tell the story of Jesus. Amen. We Amen. invite men, women, boys, and girls to trust Christ as Savior. That's what we do. Okay? Now, then it says, verse 31 and 2, Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole do not need a physician. If you are already saved as a Christian, you don't need salvation. You've already got it. Someone and asked me not many months ago, well, why, if we're already saved, why do we keep going to church? We come to God's house to praise and worship Him. Yeah. We come to God's house to learn more about His will in our life. Amen. We come to His house to learn more what the Scripture tells us to do. Right. We come to His house to be the person God wants us to be Amen. and to strengthen ourselves one with another as we study the Word of God. Amen. Now, Amen. I want to read you something I was handed this morning by Annabelle. came to us from another church, but it's talking about the secret church. The secret church is the church that is around the world that cannot openly meet like we're meeting this morning. They meet in basements. They meet in the mountain buildings. They meet in caves. And they meet any place they can hide as they bring forth the Word of God because it's too dangerous to come to a place with a sign out front that says Twin Cities Baptist Church or whatever it might say that would say this is a church meeting. Now, the idea behind the secret church comes from a man named David Platt. He spent a lot of time teaching and ministering among the underground Asian house churches. Due to the hostility from the government, the community, and even their own family, many of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are forced to work gather in secret, sometimes at the risk of their lives. The plight of our persecuted brothers and sisters also explains why prayer for the persecuted church is a major part of every secret church gathering. Every time we meet on Sunday night and Wednesday night, we pray for our missionaries and we pray for the message of the missionaries and we pray for the receiving of the gospel all around the world. We have it so good in this nation. Yes, sir. We have a freedom to worship. We have a freedom to witness. We have a freedom to tell of the story of Christ in the open atmosphere. But you don't get to do that in lots of places. So we need to pray for those missionaries and pray for their message and pray for their believers that follow Jesus in the secret places. Remember those who cannot meet openly asking God to sustain their faith, to change their hearts and the actions of their persecutors to use their witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if you want something to pray about this week, there's a good prayer thing to pray about. You can pray that God will strengthen those people and that he'll guide and protect those people and he'll provide for them an opportunity to continue the gospel message and the faith of worship. That's what's important to us. Jesus said in verse 31 of the fifth chapter of Luke's gospel, 
He answered those people who challenged him by saying unto them, They that are whole do not need a physician. How many of y'all go to the doctor when you don't hurt, not sick, don't feel real great? Nobody goes, okay? What's the first thing they ask you when you go into the doctor's office? What's wrong? If there wasn't something wrong, you wouldn't be there, would you? We don't just go by to see our doctor. We like him. We've had him for many, many years. He's a great friend, but we don't go by to say, I just came by today, Dr. Pitts, to talk to you. How y'all doing? How's your family? No. Sometimes we ask that question while we're there, but we came because we have a need. Jesus said, if you're whole in Christ, you do not need a physician. By that, I mean you don't need someone to tell you the gospel message. But they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. There's the difference. There's the difference. The message of Christ is a message to the individual that you need to make a change in your life. You see? You need to make a change in your life. That's really, really important. Now, in the book of John's Gospel, chapter 5, if you'd like to turn there with me for just a moment. Uh, we're going to start in verse 33 of John chapter 5. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 32. There is another that bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. He's talking about John the Baptist. And you sent John, and he bare witness to the truth, but I received not the testimony from man, for these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Many, many, many people believed in John the Baptist as the great deliverer, but he wasn't. He was the guy that was telling you he was coming. Let's read what John says in verse 33 of that fifth chapter. Then John, God, Jesus says, I have a greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father has given me to finish. See, Jesus came to finish his project. He didn't come to just work on it, okay? It's kind of like, if he was a contractor, he went out and he built one wall and said, I'm done with the house. He came to finish the house. That's important. Every element you need in John chapter 5, beginning there in verse 36, says, I have a greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The same works I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. I couldn't get the job done if I hadn't been empowered by the Father to do it. That's what Jesus was saying. And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape, and you have not his word abiding in you, for whom he has sent him ye believe not. Now look very carefully at verse 37. We've not heard the voice of God. We've not seen the shape of God. And his word does not abide in us as we are today unless we're a Christian, yeah, amen. unless we've trusted Jesus. Then he says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, and you will not come to me that the, you might have the life. I receive not honor from men, for I know that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that comes from God? Then he says in verse 45, 6, and 7, do not think that I accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. Now, if you were a Jewish person this morning and you had been raised in traditional Jewish theology, you would probably know the first books of the Bible, the first five books of Moses, pretty much by memory by the time you get to be a, a latter teenager. And so you've got this witness of Moses, and God said it's an important witness because it witnesses of Christ. Then witness of Moses, witnesses of Christ. And so he says, For had you believed Moses, you would have believed in me. For he wrote of me. If you believe not his writings, how shall you receive my words? So there's not a Jew living that will not be accountable to God for knowing what they knew about Jesus, but still rejecting him as Messiah. It's the great sad thing about this happening. That would be like if Jesus said to us in our generation of the church age, you already know about me because I've, they've written about me and my word is there and I came and lived among you and, and suffered and bled and died and rose again and after 40 days of sending back to glory. Why would you not say you had a chance to know me? 
I've already been here. I have been among you. Now, let me tell you what Jesus says to us in John chapter 6, beginning in verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, or verily, I say unto you, You seek me not because you saw the miracles, because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Most of the people who followed Jesus followed him for food. Remember the feeding of the thousands? Does there, is there a single verse of Scripture that says anybody came and followed him after that? No. No. He took those little loaves and fishes and fed that vast multitude, picked up 12 baskets of fragments that are indicating of his ability to take care of the tribes of Israel. And yet not one person followed Jesus. So this is a very true statement. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Then he tells us our challenge. Do not labor for the meat which perishes, but for the meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man, that be Jesus Christ, shall give unto you by faith, for him hath God the Father sealed. He has a finished and sealed work. Nothing else is needed. See, when you trust Christ as Savior, you don't need anything else. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to be sprinkled. You don't have to write a check. You don't have to do any work. You just trust Christ by faith. That's all you do. Remember when the thief was on the cross? He said to me, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He believed that God had a kingdom. He believed that there was a way he could be with God forever. He believed that Christ could forgive him of his sins. He said, I know I'm here because I've done bad things. I've broken the laws of God. I don't know what kind of a criminal he was, if he was one who stole, or if he was one who killed, or if he was one who lied. I don't care what he did. If it broke a law of God, he needed to be put on that cross. You see? This is what we have to understand. We are lost when we have not trusted Christ as Savior. You're born lost. Many of us grow up lost to a certain point, and then God's Spirit graciously woos us to Christ and we make a decision for Jesus and we become born again. So we can avoid that. Christ has paid for our sins. I don't have to pay for my sins. Not at all. Because Christ has paid for my sins. I know I've shared this story before, but many years ago in the Depression days, in a little small one-room schoolhouse, a little boy had stolen a lunch because he was hungry. And the teacher made him come to the front of the class and, and told him that he had to take his shirt off. And she went and got her little whip and she was going to give him a real lashing. And he was just a frail little boy. And a big old boy rose up in the back and said, Teacher, I'll take his stripes. She said, Why would you do that? Because I want to. Why did Christ take our sin debt? Because he wanted to. He wanted to. See? He knew we couldn't handle our sin debt by ourselves. He wanted to help us. So he stepped up and said, I'll take their sin debt. I'll die that they might live and that they might live eternally and that they might spend that eternity with me. That is critically important for us to understand that, that we have. Jesus said unto them, This is the work of God that you believe on him whom God has sent. That, of course, would be Jesus Christ. And John 6 and uh, 33, Jesus says, For the bread of, bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth his life unto the world. That would be Jesus Christ. And they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the way of the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. And that's spiritual stuff. That's not physical stuff. Many a Christian will starve to death in this world. Many a person will die in great physical needs but they won't die in spiritual needs if they're Christians because God has supplied that for us. See? Then he says, verse 37, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will no wise cast out. We can never lose that opportunity to spend that great day with Jesus. Look at verse 40. This is the will of him that sent me, that be the will of God, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Isn't that going to be wonderful? Just think about it. You know, if Jesus came today, as we got through a church service, say we're driving down the road out here and we pass Cedar Lawn, if that's the day of resurrection, 
The Bible said the dead in Christ will rise first. We'll see them rising. We'll know they're rising. And you know what we won't do? I'm not going to have to open the sunroof. <laughs> he'll take me right where I am. And he'll call us and change us in that moment. We'll be, the Bible said we'll be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. And called us to be with the Lord. And so shall we what? Ever be with the Lord. Amen. We'll never be without him again. It's a great, grand, and glorious experience to think about the day of resurrection. Yes, sir. You know, a few day, weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, Bobby Gregor called me to come over and help her plan her funeral, and I was glad to go and do that. And as we sat there and talked about that, it was more than just what's going to happen when I'm gone. It's what's going to happen when he comes for me, you see. Think about that. It's a temporary thing. The Bible says we become asleep in Jesus, only to be wakened in a moment right. when resurrection comes. Amen. But the moment we close our eyes in death to the moment we open them, we open them in the presence of Jesus. Time means nothing to us, you see. How long will it be to make any difference? You might be in the ground 100 years, or you might be in the ground 1,000 years, or you might be in there 10,000 years. I don't know how many years would make any difference. You close in death and awaken resurrection. How exciting that could be for us as Christians. Amen. Book of Romans chapter 8, if you want to follow with us this morning. I'm going to read you three verses which are really critical to what we believe about our Lord. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus. When you've trusted Christ as Savior, you're not condemned any longer. Those who walk not after the flesh, but who walk after the Holy Spirit's leadership. In verse 1. For the law of the Holy Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's at the spiritual level. Okay? We still had to face physical death unless the Lord comes as we described a moment ago. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. What was weak about the law? There's a lot of things the flesh had to do. And the flesh don't have any power. Amen. See? So, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Christ came without a sin debt, but he took mine and yours on him. See? So when he went to the cross, the Bible says in another passage, he said, it's though I were a cart heavily loaded with sins. And that's what he was bearing every day, the sins of the world. Okay? When he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's such a beautiful picture, Christ has gone there early in the morning, and he's in prayer. And he's praying that God will just continue to give him resources and give him strength and guide him in wisdom and help him to deal with being in a fleshly body, surrendering the command of God to die for the sins of the world. And finally, he says the great sentence, not my will, but thy will, Lord, be done. Give me the strength to do what you want me to do, what I've been called to do, what I've been sent to do even though I'm living in this human body. See, as God, he knows the future, so he already knew what it would feel like to have him put spikes through his hands and feet. He already knew that. He already knew they'd offer him soured wine when he was on the cross and thirsty. He already knew how humiliated he'd be to be hung naked upon that cross for all the world to see. And what are those who were there around that cross? Can you imagine his agony and pain as his mother stood there? Oh, Think about that. But that was required. You see, Jesus paid it all. That's why the Bible says, and all to him we owe. You know? But with his shed blood, he's cleansed us and made us the individual that God called us to be. Now God says to us, let's step up. And we need to do that. Now, Verse 22 of that Ace Romans chapter 8 says, We know that the whole creation groans and tra travails in pain together until now. What happens every day? The Teutonic plates move. Every day we have a shift in earth masses. It's an alive thing. The earth is al it's alive and it moves. And when it shifts in the ocean, we get tsunamis. We get earthquakes. We get all kinds of things that happen. 
because the earth is literally alive. And it changes every day. You know? This whole world is not the way it used to be. It's getting worse. It's getting worse at two or three different levels. And we're going to share those in just a moment. You go to the book of, of uh, take our Bibles here and go to the book of Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 this morning is a beautiful passage. We're going to start at verse uh, 24. Colossians 3, 24, if you follow with me. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. God did not ask you to serve him without reward. I've often thought about the fact that he has done so much for us while we're here, how can we possibly complain about not getting something extra? But he says we will have something extra because he won't ask us to serve him without an inheritance of reward. But he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong for which he hath done, and there is no respect to persons. None of us are any better than another. And the difference between all of us is if we've trusted Christ or we have not trusted Christ. And it's that simple. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. So when you go out the back, the front door of the church today, is when the moment when the service is over, you'll be walking out into a very hostile world. A hostile world because it's a world that does not know Christ as you do. So when you re hear the news this afternoon or read in the newspaper where this one killed that one and this one stole from that one and this one beat this one and this one embezzled over here and this one did over there, that's just normal things for those people. You see? And what's the difference in them and us? We know Jesus. Yep. That's the difference. Oh, amen. We're not the enemy of God. No, sir. We're a friend of God. We're born again people. Altered and changed by the power of God. Yeah, and it's simple to do by just trusting Jesus as your Savior. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, for this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually means which has an effect working also in you that believe. When you know Jesus, the word will work in your life. And you can be a see a change in your life. The first thing that came to me as a Christian was peace. I knew I'd avoided hell. I knew I'd gained heaven. And that's the most important decision I ever made. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. The most important decision you'll ever make is to trust Christ as your Savior. Yes, sir. And then you'll have the peace the Bible. The psalmist said, peace that passes understanding. You can't explain salvation to a lost person. When they say, well, what do you mean you've got peace? Here's what I like to tell them. When you have settled the matter between you and Jesus Christ by faith, and you're a born-again child of God, allowing Christ to pay for your sins in the eyes of Almighty God, and have your name planted in the Lamb's Book of Life, everything else in your life is small stuff. Oh, small changes, sir. We got up yesterday morning, and Annabelle said, Doug, the furnace didn't come on. Okay. So, knowing so little about stuff, I just enjoy what I've got. I go in and she said, maybe we need a new battery in the thermostat. So I thought, that sounds reasonable. <laughs> so I go over and I open the cover and guess what? We don't have any batteries in our thermostat. <laughs> it's hardwired in. Okay, so we know that's not the problem. And so then I call my good friend Jack Carter that I've used out here at the church and at my home for many, many, many years. We grew up together as little kids. I've known him since I was about four or five. And I got another man. He said, this is Robert. And I said, Robert who? Uh, is Jack around? He said, uh, I'd already told him, this is Doug Grissom. He said, Doug, uh, Jack retired three months ago and he gave the business to his son-in-law and he said, uh, he sold it to me and said, what can I help you with? My furnace don't work. Mm -hmm. So he came out during what, 35, 40 minutes on a Saturday busy, Saturday morning. Goes in, climbs up into my attic. 
as he got up there, he opened it, got about halfway up the steps. He said, that's uh, some kind of fan motor. I can smell it. Okay. So he comes down and he said, it's a 123rd horsepower motor. I never heard of such an animal. I hope we can still find one of those animals. Because what it does is it recycles my burn fuel so it's more efficient. He said, you don't have a big gas here built here. Dad said, no, we don't. It's real cheaper than house. We didn't even reach wipers. He said, that's why it's so cheap. It burns the gases, recatches them off the clay, burns them a second time. And then this little fan comes on, and it opens up the vent and pops what little bit is left out and closes back up. So I said, it don't run with that. He said, oh, no. Okay. So what did we do? We've got a little few electric heaters. We just turned them on in the den, went on about our business, and prayed for warm weather. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'll have to try to find that, and I'll get it, and I'll come put it in for you. But I thought all of a sudden, my good friend, lifelong friend, retires and forgot to phone and tell me that I'm not going to help you anymore. <laughs> but you know, I'll never get a call like, have a call like that with Jesus, will I? Amen. See? Amen. I'll never have a call like that with Jesus. There won't be anybody there to say, well, guess what? Jesus is retired. <laughs> you know, he's not here anymore. He can't help you. No, he'll never do that. You know? And I saw the great contrast between what God does for us what man can do for us. The furnace is the small stuff. Now, if he can't fix the whole thing, buying a new one will be big stuff. But that's the way it'll be. But you see, whatever comes your way, you have one to stand with you in your trauma, in your terror, in the darkness of night, in the brightness of day, in the valley, and up on the mountain. And that's the joy. Dean is saying to us a little bit this morning about the fact that if we didn't have darkness, we wouldn't appreciate the light. Amen. And that's what we need to do each week. We need to appreciate the opportunity to come into God's house and look into his word and be encouraged and strengthened and fortified by the joy that Jesus puts in our lives as believers. Let's pray together. Kind and loving Heavenly Father, around the world today in the secret church that cannot meet openly as we have this morning, and how we pray for their strength and their wisdom and their courage. To thank Lord that we would not be able to come to a place like this, to blend our voices in praise unto you and to, and to search your word with your spirit's leadership to determine what we need and how to apply it. We're so grateful for those people who have the courage to do what they're doing. And we lift up and pray for those missionaries and teachers who continue to share the word of God with them in most difficult places. The Middle East is becoming a terror-filled place for the people of God. In many places, they are burning their homes, killing many of them, driving them out of the country. And you say, well, why would they want to be there? Because they know the message of Jesus. You see, someone suffered for us. Someone prayed for you before you became a Christian. I can remember many people's names I could announce to you this morning who prayed for me before I met Jesus. And I'm grateful for their prayers. I'm grateful for their care and I'm grateful for their concern. And so we want to magnify that as we pray for others. Remember, nothing is as important as the shared word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless us now in these moments. Forgive us of our sins and meet our needs in the time of invitation for those who might have a need of trusting Jesus in his precious name. Amen. Stand with us. 307. Just as I am in
this week I would like to ask you to be in daily prayer for Cecil Adams and for Bobby Gregory, for Mary Melvin, and others that we don't know. Remember to pray for our missionaries. You don't have to know their name. Just ask God to strengthen and protect them. Amen. Continue to pray that the word gospel message will continue to go forth in our nation as well as all the nations of the world so that many can come to know Jesus Christ. I often think, well, what my life, would my life have been like if my mother had not been a Christian? If she had not taken me to church even when I didn't want to go. Amen. You know? And God graciously gave me that opportunity to know Him as Savior. It's one of the greatest, greatest joy of my life. Yep. And so we want to pray that for everyone that we know throughout this week. We'd like to ask you also to remember this thy church, that we might grow. God would send new people to come and be with us here. That we might be able to meet the needs of the church, keep it open and functioning. And so that's a great prayer of my life. Well, I'd like you to join me in that. Brother Steve, you lead us in your prayer. Now, Father, thank God, as we're here today, we know your strength and your power are what holds this place together. Your strength and your Holy Spirit in each one of us causes this body to function. Amen. And Lord, as we know, the ones that are not able to be here this morning, their names are mentioned. They would so want to be here. Yeah. And Brother Bill. And now that I be here, but we just thank you for them as they continue to serve, even though they're physically not here. Amen. They pray and they share. Yes, sir. And Lord, again, as we listen to the words this morning coming to our heart, let us take those words and use them. Let us not be locking your word inside this building. Yes, sir. Amen. And share it with those around about. Amen. There's opportunities that's coming by direction. There's challenges to talk to some folks. They're laying on the bed, dying, that I know. No, you're not. Use me, use someone, to be able to convey to them the meaning of Christ in their life. Tell it, Brother Steve. Lord, again, we just thank you for the privilege of being here. We know as we come back tonight, we open up the book and Look into your mighty words that you'll continue to strengthen this stuff with us. And Jesus will spread your strength with us. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.